I'm really glad to see so many people that I know, and I, I hope that this won't be repetition for you of my early days. I suspect it will be. When I was looking through all the material that we could have done and talking to Sven about what we could read, I decided that the most efficient thing to do in 35 minutes would be just to go back to the beginning and just to, to concentrate on one of the books that Stephen Gould and I, I had the privilege of, of working on with Stephen Gould. And it will be the first one, which is Illuminations, a Bestiary. Because that is, that is ABC, and I think somehow beginning there. I have to say that I'm supposed to be the artist here. And I know that as an artist, what happens is that I pick up a book and I start to read it, and I think I'm going to read this whole book about the Burgess Shale, or I'm going to read, I'm going to read, uh, you know, the I, I can read Stephen Jay Gould's work because he makes you think that you really have understood it. There's something about the way he writes that keeps you going. At least it did for me, and I read his books for quite a while before I ever met him. But what I was really going to say is where a scholar, I believe, starts with the text and then eventually comes to the images, I, I go the other way. I start with something I see, and then eventually I want to read about it, and then I want to know more and more. So, But I don't get into scholarly work until I've actually been looking at something for a long time, and I have scholar friends who are just the opposite. You know, they'll read many books and then wonder what something looks like. And, and I, it, I just think it's, it's curious. But I don't retain what I've read because what happens is I'll read a paragraph and it will give me an idea. And then I'll go off for six months. And I have, I have a book. Well, you know, I think I could talk too much and we really have to cover a lot of ground. So I'm going to start. I'm very grateful to Sven Burkertz for reading because that's the other thing. I don't know how anybody can show pictures and also read at the same time. Um, and thank you, Deborah, for inviting us. OK. Now, d does the, d the lights get any lower, or do we just? I first went into the, um, the Natural History Museum because I was a photographer, tired of taking portraits of, of my friends who really didn't like the results. And I thought, now I think if I'm going to look at, the, look at the world, I should go where I don't really like what I'm looking at, but I'm forced to take a photograph of it. And that was the Natural History Museum because I really couldn't stand it. I didn't like animals, didn't like dead animals. And one of the one of the early ones that I did were a series of of ape skins that I hung in the window in various ways. And then that that single image helped me in work from then on somehow think about the monkey, the museum, the whole the whole sort of setup. And in the back room, you know, there's just sort of amazing things and this isn't this is the head of an Irish deer, great Irish deer, in Dublin, just in the cell in the cellar. And the dolphins hanging, just forever perpetually swimming in midair in, in Leiden. And I did a series of this is all before I, I started to really uh, to work with the Stephen. I did a series of of bats for a bat exhibition at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And I, I photographed x-rays of bats, and I combined them in various ways. And then I started taking color photographs and setting things up. And I, I chose to photograph a pangolin with a pine cone because I thought they had a certain affinity for each other. And I, I set them up and left the room. And at this point, no biologist really was happy to see me coming into the museum because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and they really didn't have the time for it. But I set it up and left the room, came back. And, and, or, and one of them said, well, why, what are you doing? And I said, well, I just thought that the pangolin looked like a book. 
and then I left the room, came back, and they were having an argument about pan whether or not a pangolin was more like a book or an artichoke. <laughs> And illuminations, and Stephen saw the bat show, and we started talking, and we became friends, and, and we decided that we would do a bestiary together. So this is also a bat, a cleared and stained bat. And in the, in the introduction to the book, which we have copies of here for you to see, they, he writes about he came around to the introduction of the book after, of course, I'd taken a lot of the photographs. But, but he, we got together and he said, I think, you know, best year would be nice to do A to Z natural history specimens. But I had, uh, this, is a, this is a jaw through the branch of a tree that I had photographed in Copenhagen. And because it was right on the floor beside me, I turned it around and photographed the backside. And I showed him how the jaw had gotten through the branch. It would fall into the woods and had it grown, you know, a, a horse died. The branch grew around the horse branch. And um, he just thought that to, to be able to take something out of an engraving, because it came from an engraving, a famous engraving of Ole Worm's natural history collection in Copenhagen. It's on the shelf. You can see it there. But to have something sort of fast forwarded from the past like that, and there, it's way, way back. I don't know if this is focused or not, but it's way back on the, on the shelf, way back here. And to be standing in a room with this engraving and then also see it beside you was really quite startling. Now, we, we went uh, a, to, a to Z, but I, he said, we did this because, of course, I didn't know very much about natural history, but I was also taking the photograph bringing him the photograph, and then he would do the text. So that he, I would take a photograph for various sympathetic reasons to the subject, and then he would find something to write about it. And now, this is, these are the <clears throat> ibis eggs. In a rare, direct imposition upon modes and realities of preservation in museums, Rosamond has playfully drawn circles in the universal patina of all collections, dust. Thus, the banded contrast of nature and storage combines with the natural form of eggs to force these disappointed containers of future ibises into similarity with the beach-rounded pebbles made of dark igneous rock intruded by bands of white quartz or calcite, and so often found on New England's beaches. Eggs achieve their streamlining by direct shaping in the oviduct, pebbles by the opposite route of erosive sculpturing from original roughness, but the common form does reflect a higher similarity of forces. Since dust pervades museums and seems both ineradicable and constant, sleuths may use its thickness as a guide to the age and stratigraphy of collections. I once opened a drawer in an old part of our collections, the contents had been dumped and sheepishly piled back in disarray, but obviously very long ago as the dust testified. I found a note also encrusted by the Universal Patina. It was dated 1861 and contained both an apology and exculpating explanation penned by a terrified student, lest the intense and temperamental boss of the museum, Louis Agassiz himself, discover such a calamity without appropriate documentation. Hagazi obviously never opened the drawer. The student, Nathaniel Southgate Shaler, went on to become a famous scientist. The dust still rains and rains. Flamingos are named for their flaming red color. Flamenco dancing has the same root. But colors fade after death and only become bright in the first place when flamingos can find food with properly convertible chemicals, thus proving the old motto, Der Mann ist was ist, was er ist, you are what you eat, that most preciously absurd of all biological notions, that flamingos evolved their red color to gain protection from enemies by fading into invisibility before the sunset 
fails from this observation of inconstant redness, among other reasons. Now, very, just very briefly, I just was drawing circles to clear the eggs. I really wanted to see the eggs, and I was not allowed to take the lid off the box. So I just used my fingers, and it worked. And these, the, the flamingos came out of the drawer like these umbrellas that had been sort of folded up and left, and, and I needed to photograph them. <clears throat> A remarkable and fortuitous similarity of shape links the entire outside ear against body with a cross section through the porous structure of an elephant's skull, where one junction seems to mimic the slope and form of the ear. In another sense, however, we can specify a deeper causal link for another aspect of this accidental similarity, and it flows from the most outstanding of all elephantine properties, size. Elephants are the largest terrestrial mammals, Large animals tend to live longer than smaller creatures. This elephant, old by virtue of its size, has experienced all the shocks and minor traumas of a long life, thus producing the frayed and weather-beaten appearance of skin and ears that sets so much mm. of the similarity we perceive with the complex structure of skull bones. As another consequence of size, elephants live near the limit of supportable weight on land. Life near the edge demands a reduction of weight whenever possible. The massive head requiring such extensive musculature for support and motion becomes a primary target for evolutionary lightening and the spongy texture producing the fortuitous resemblances to ear and skin thereby arose as another consequence of size age and enlightenment join. Crabs are a primary cultural symbol of disorder in the sinister sense. We expect elongation and forward motion among the bilaterally symmetrical higher creatures, but crabs are rounded and move sidewards. In Aesop's fable, a mother crab castigates her youngster for its ungraceful walk and receives an appropriate reprimand. How thou goest, I will go. Galen tells us that the claw-like extensions of spreading cancers prompted his countrymen to appropriate the animal as a name for this disease of disordered growth, an association sufficiently unpleasant that many newspapers now bowdlerize their astrological charts and relabel the ancient constellation of the crab, cancer, with the inappropriate moon children. <laughs> Seen from the top, these Japanese crabs of the genus Zosimus might elicit the conventional feeling of a bumpy, disconcerting irregularity. But crabs are crustaceans, members of the phylum Arthropoda, and the most ordered of complex animals in their construction as a sequence of repeated segments. Since 80% of animal species are arthropods, mostly insects, the basic design surely seems to work. Seen from the bottom, these same crabs shed their cultural liability, legs neatly ordered in pairs, culminating in frontal claws, the two rows separated by a posterior extension neatly tucked under, stretch it out, and crabs proclaim their affinity with elongated relatives among lobsters and shrimp. Now, of course, what I was really loving were the, were the shapes, the forms, the way the light hit them or didn't light, hit them, the upside down, the backside. I mean, it's so much, it gave me so much pleasure to work with them for an hour, just a few crabs. Lobodan. <clears throat> literally the bumpy-toothed seal, uses the straining mesh of corrugated teeth to filter krill, small arthropods, from the plankton. Modern baleen whales, the largest animals that have ever lived, no dinosaur ever came close to a blue whale in the heavyweight derby, subsist paradoxically on the same tiny krill, also filtering them from the plankton, but with huge plates of whalebone. 
Flamingos, while wading in shallow hypersaline ponds, swing their heads down and with beaks reversed, also filter small arthropods on complex ridges and furrows evolved from their bills. Three creatures of no close relationship all make a living in the same way, with structures of similar function fashioned from different bits of anatomy, tooth, jawbones, and bills. Such convergence is nature's finest illustration of adaptation, good fit between form and function, built differently because evolutionary pasts must peak through current excellence. Rosamond and I agreed at the outset that we would trust each other's different professionalisms and would not question choice of photos or textural themes. Yet we argued more about this photo than any other. I found the identification number ordinary and discordant, the ubiquitous method used by museums to catalog specimens and incidentally so often to destroy their aesthetic integrity. She found it striking and unusual, a kind of prison signature with many layers of meaning. It is well that an artist and a natural historian should see the meaning of a simple alteration so differently and as a result of so many years spent thinking in a certain unchallenged way. The only overarching theme of a bestiary is diversity. You see, what was so remarkable about, him, about Stephen is that you could bring him pictures and think that you were showing them to him as you had meant to take them and as they were, and he could see into them and spell out the biology. And this is very good for somebody who is a little skittish about being in a classroom because you take those things back when you go to the museum again and you proceed. I've got to keep moving here. We're good? We're good. Okay. This is my timekeeper. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Um, also, I don't like tags and, and labels, but this one seemed about right. And the, the, the teeth are just like like complicated lanterns or lamps. Um, this is about this is about labels and how museums um, museums um, <laughs> insist on labeling everything. But this is a beautiful top of the trunk that came back in the last at the end of the last century um, to the Academy of Natural Science, full of skins and. Uh, from afar, from, from a distance. And it's just the paint that has, that has sort of settled in after many years. And um, this, this one, um, Sven is going to read about. I, I hope that you can see, see it. We mur oh, I'm okay. sorry, did I interrupt you? Yeah, no, 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 go. Okay. <laughs> we murder to dissect, wrote Wordsworth. But I find his defense of totality altogether too encompassing. I would never denigrate the virtues of wholeness, but who can deny both the scholarly and aesthetic pleasures of decomposing integrity into components and then identifying the order behind their amalgamation? Principles of order vary according to discipline and object, but geologists and historians in general favor a study of overlay to determine temporal order as the chief tool for unraveling a complex ensemble. Simply put, the thing one must, simply put, thing one must be older than thing two. <laughs> if thing two overlies or otherwise modifies thing one in a manner implying the initial presence of thing one alone. <laughs> Geologists tend to be quite literal about overlying. We determine temporal order by the so-called law of superposition, strata on top of a pile win the prize for youthfulness, because the bottom layers must have been deposited first. This fossil fish from the Solnhofen limestone of Germany illustrates the power of overlying as a criterion for understanding the genesis of a complex totality. We note a sequence of layers from inside to outside and from deep embedding to barely adhering superficiality. We see in the fish itself both inside, the bony skeleton, and outside, the form of the fins and body outline, since soft parts can be preserved in the exquisite 
Solnhofen fauna. The cracks overlie both fish and surrounding rock and must therefore post-date the fossil's formation. Similarly, and obviously in this case, for we understand human interventions better than nature's ordinary ways, the metal staple suturing the main crack below the fossil must represent the youngest stratum of the sequence. Atop this natural ensemble of rock, fossil, and cracks, we note a variety of human overlays in two forms, writing directly upon the stone and adhering paper. Penciled numbers to the right, 29 plus 17 and three and a half, may mark the oldest additions and may represent measurements or inventories. The inked number is a Harvard Museum identification, MCZ for Museum of Contemporary Zoology, and here we note overlay within overlay, for the first number has been crossed out and replaced by a second, obviously later, designation. Finally, <clears throat> consider the puzzling words gold and oyster seemingly printed on the rock. A resolution for this latest layer required some real detective work. In the museum's drawers in Solnhofen, fossil fishes, we found several thin 19th century printed lists from the Süddeutsches Correspondence Bureau in München. These lists provide daily rates of exchange for European currency. The categories include gold and currency from Austria, Österreich. These sheets must have been used as a packing material to separate and protect slabs of fossils when a large collection of Sonhofen material traveled from Germany to America. Parts of the thin paper, pressed by the weight of fossils above, stuck to the stone. Fibers of the paper can be seen clearly under a microscope. Note also the large scrap of paper near the fossil's head. Intellectual life should not be construed as two cultures of science and humanities at war, or even at variance. Human culture arose from the material substrate of a complex brain, and science and art meld in continuity. The sequence of superposition on this rock, an unbroken transition from things of nature to things of art, flesh to rock to paper to ink, illustrates the embedding of mind in nature. How to ruin a perfectly beautiful fossil from the Solenhofen. <laughs> and by museum people. <laughs> anyway, the, the next few are on labels and in museums and but well and this so this comes from Philadelphia and is an egg that was uh, found by Audubon in Florida and it's signed by him in pencil and it's a mess i mean it's broken and the cotton is full of insects and the box is too small but it's an absolute treasure because he signed it in pencil and i find that irrational <laughs> And here is another from Philadelphia, and it is it is the skull of a, of a convict who was who was also supposedly a cannibal, and he was in, imprisoned in New South Wales, and then finally finally executed. And his name is Pierce, and his skull belongs to a, a, a famous collection in Philadelphia, Samuel Morton's collection of skulls of people from around the world, and one of those um, or those 19th century benighted uh, experiments where you put people's heads together and you try to figure out how they relate to each other and who's smarter than who and who's a criminal. Um, and then this, this is a curious object that was in the MCZ years ago, which is a way somebody was, was studying the scales of a fish. Rather than pressing the whole fish, taking the scales off one at a time, pasting it on paper, and then making a notation about where from the fish it came from. And it makes a, a very curious kind of <coughs> crackling document. And these are uh, from Toredo. They're shipworms. They bore into wood in such a way that a photographer is uh, very attracted to this because of the apparent concave, convex um, surface of it. And so when, you, when you, you pick out the piece of this tiny little wood and 
couple came from the ends of pirate ships and so forth. They're very small, but when you put them in sunlight, the tunnels just go mad. I mean, they, this is the great thing about photography, is turning something that is not even uh, three-dimensional into the appearance into the appearance of endless three-dimensionality. And then here's another one. This is one that has been reclassified. The previous one wasn't a label, actually. I guess it just that it went with the rest of rest of these. But this is a piece of this is a, a piece of a of a hardened remains of ship worms, the same that you saw in the previous um, section. It had been supposedly from, taken from the London clay, and people thought for years that it came from London Bridge and was just sort of a, a hardened example of the wood from the old London Bridge. But then, and it was in a museum for a certain period of time, and then somebody from the Geology Museum came and reinterpreted it and said, no, these are fossils. These are very, very old. Um, not necessarily ship worms, but these are very old worms, and this is a fossil, and we're going to take it to our museum now. Thank you. And then this is, this is a beautifully preserved um, and carefully annotated and with all the documentation of tobacco that was brought back from Lewis and Clark from their expedition with all sorts of uh, affidavits and uh, Bio, biological identification. And then this is the, um, a sign for a giraffe that was taken by Monsieur Vo and Henry Gibson in Central Africa. And it's, it's always sort of, an, to me, it's always sort of ironic that it's the people who brought these things back that are usually given the best signs and the most sort of a, a play. Right now, I often, as you saw from the shipworms, I look, and as in the words of Minor White, things for what else they are. Now, I never studied with Minor White, but I've always had that phrase, uh, you know, in my back pocket wherever I go. It's very useful when you're looking at something and you see something else in it. Just go for it. That's sort of my method. So this is a, a sleeping orangutan in a rock, a random rock. And looking through through a turtle and seeing that he he actually has a sort of a unexpected shell of a turtle against the sun. Eurypterus. Right. <clears throat> sorry. And now <laughs> this is the Eurypterus. Eurypterus. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Like the Death's Head on an early New England gravestone, peeks forth from its entombing sediment as a revelation from scientific craftsmen early in our century. Fossil perpetrators with dynamite and pickaxes for collection, hammers and rock crushers for discovery, and tiny chisels and dental picks for detailed exposure. Eurypterids, denizens of freshwater lakes, are the largest arthropods that ever lived. This head shield seems to show eyes, a clear nose with side lobes, and a grim mouth. The eyes are correct, the rest illusion in human terms. We see the top of a Eurypterid head shield. The eyes look forward, upward in the photo, not at us. The nose is a bump on the midline of the upper surface. The mouth, a junction between head and body plates of a segment, segmented animal. The true mouth lies underneath, still hugging the sediment and unliberated by the perpetrator. I just have to say that whenever Sven is reading, it comes from illuminations. And whenever I'm pattering on, it probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then I have to add something every now and then to what, to what he may be reading. OK. The so-called eye spots on the backs and wings of many insects may serve several possible functions. In some species, they loom large, as if truly the eyes of a much bigger creature, and may thereby scare predators away. In others, they lie at an expendable periphery, attracting a predator's attention to wingtip and the air beyond, and not to the vulnerable body. In any case, the enormous variety of circles, bars, and splotches invites our own playful interpretation. 
whether the function, if any, for the insects that carry them. One naturalist found in moth and butterfly wings all the letters to reproduce a line of Rethke's poetry. <laughs> Quote, all finite things reveal infinitude, mm -hmm. unquote. Here, arrayed like cartoon early worms poking their heads above the ground, we see dark spots at the wingtips of Samia moths facing each other in two rows. Very important how you crop a picture. <laughs> Gentile alouette is a lark, but Aulouata, the South American howler monkey, scarcely merits the near homonymy. Numerical comparisons of Aluata with other New World monkeys have identified this genus as a phyletic giant, an animal that has grown beyond the usual trajectory for its group, thereby accentuating features that are increasing but stop sooner in related species. This status explains both the massive lower jaws and the small brain relative to body size. Jaws increase more rapidly, brains more slowly than bodies as primates grow. Aluata has simply extended these common trends. This massive jaw also underlies the double take of this photograph. We seem to see a face looking at us, but it is only a pseudo Janus, for we are looking through the rear end of the skull. The circle on top is the giveaway, for we do not witness a trepanation of the skull but the foramen magnum, or great hole, that articulates skull with spinal column. The mouth and teeth are the animal's own, though we see them through the skull and in the distance. But the corners of its hat are the arches of its upper jaw, while the hunched shoulders are the massive lower jaw. Now, I spent quite a while looking through the backs you understand that, that, the, that the head is facing away from me, and I'm down low and looking up towards the sun. And I took a number of howler monkey jaws and did the same thing, and every one had a different personality when seen through the back. Nothing so stuns my mind as an image misinterpreted in scale by orders of magnitude because it has no sure reference point in human bodies or artifacts. The Grand Teton Mountains are named for their whimsical resemblance to the female breast. Fossil mastodons, extinct elephants, evolved molars with cusps and pinnacled rows. So another man of science named them breast tooth. This ancient tooth in the cradle of cotton wool provided by museum curators for its protection might pass for Wyoming. Size, Julian Huxley once remarked, has a fascination of its own. Now, I'm sure that a number of you have heard me tell the story about how this tooth happened. I'm going to tell it really fast. I went to the paleontology department because I was working on the alphabet and I said, I need something that begins with an M. And um, forgive me if you've heard this story before, but and he, the, uh, the curator said, well, we don't do things like that around here. And I said, well, everything is alphabetic and so forth. And finally, he's produced a mastodon tooth. And I said, well, do you have another one? He said, well, this is a very good one. I said, do you have another one? Find another one. He said, I'm not sure. He gave me a third. He said, that's nice. I like that one. He says, broken. Why do you like that? I said, I like that. Took it to the sun, brought it back. And when I got the picture, I said, now, doesn't it look like the Andes? Looks like a landscape. And he looked at me and said, it's a tooth. <laughs> so writing appears in everything. I mean, you know, there's sort of the, the, you look through the turtle and you think you see some writing on the shell, and then you look at these <coughs> contraband snake skins, um, enormous skins, and you see writing. Um, Ole Vorm in Copenhagen was once sent a lobster <coughs> from Norway because the person who sent it was certain that they saw ancient runes written all over it. Mm -hmm. But because Ole Vorm was, was uh, actually himself made himself an expert on early runes, he could tell them that no, it was really just the markings on the shell. 
Now things look like other things. Here's a piece of hematite that was taken from a mine in, in, in England that is like a bird wing, but it isn't. It is that mineral. And then here's another one, another form of hematite, which comes out differently. And I think it has to do with whether or not it has to do with oxidation or the process in which these are formed, but it looks the same mineral. Stones that look like but are not books. In a very large landscape, and a fossil fish. And I thought the reason that these, I found these just very recently, the reason I think because this vegetation at the bottom is so much like the dendrite on the fossil. And there is on the mountain, and I cannot read it at this distance, but Will, it is sort of, we love you, our Oman. And I would like to know which Oman this is. I think I look him up later, but it goes with this fossil insect, I meant to say. And the dendrite, that is the chemically formed, the mineralization that's formed at the bottom was so much like the vegetation. This is not vegetable, this is mineral. And then um, picture stones from the Renaissance, from marbles that made, made the collectors feel that they were actually looking at <laughs> an indication that that God was trying to tell them something about, about uh, constructions or buildings or saints, and also again with some ancient uh, dendrite at the bottom. And at polished agate that looks so much like a volcano with its pyroclastic core, very small. And uh, the nest of a Gila a woodpecker uh, made out of an old cactus pod. Looks very much like a Dutch, like a shoe that I saw that had been in the Dutch canal for a long time. Now this is, this is a, the third book that we did. Now that I am going to characterize this a bit because the second book was, was Finders Keepers and it was eight collectors and the texts are enormous and the topics are you know, Peter the, are, are really big, Agassiz, Peter the Great. I mean, they're just, you know, you'd be here all night, basically. But so I decided to just go to this. It's, it's, it's a book in which we would take two, sometimes three images and put them together in the way of talking about a single topic. And these are the bones of, a, of an elephant bird, just the leg bones. So it was an enormous extinct bird from Madagascar. And we paired this with a bird of paradise that, uh, and it was about legs. We paired it with a bird of paradise that, that basically was brought back from Europe without its legs. And so people who were collecting them in when it, during the 17th century, say, thought that the bird just lived on air, never touched the ground. And a collection of shell, two two collections of shells. The first one from Aldrovandi, um, from Bologna, very very neatly organized, just just so. And compared, um, then then Stephen compared these to the shells that were used on the on a piece of the Watts Tower in Los Angeles, Simon Rodia. So it was sort of the the, the business of somebody who was in a you know in a really. Uh, a privileged university, very sorry, privileged university, very scholarly organizing things. And then the impulse to collect shells is universal. Uh, and, and heads, again, this is sort of like the, the cannibal skull it is. It's, it's life casts of, of the faces of the natives of the island of Nias in order to show evolutionary diversity in a small population. This was done by an early um, anthropologist at the beginning of the 19th century. And it must have been very, very uncomfortable to sit with the plaster on the face with the straws up their nose. Everyone looks very cross, very cross. Uh, 
And this is something that I, I made out of a, uh, let's see, a, sort of a glass um, chessboard that had been, you know, the paint had been flaking and the backs were, were, were empty. And so I filled them with faces wherever I could. It's called How You Play the Game. It's How You Play the Game. And I think Sven has <coughs> something to read here. It's called Faces Are Special. We cannot perceive the world in a totally objective manner, for we must filter reality through meshes of physiological preference and social prejudice. Among such biases of perception, none surpasses our genetically encoded tendency to recognize faces. Neurologists have developed good evidence, including numerous studies of cerebral mapping and neuronal firing for such a useful preference in many mammalian species. This strong perceptual bias both prov provides benefits and causes troubles. I doubt that we would see faces in the illusionist paintings of Archimboldo, human portraits constructed from composite fruits, vegetables, fish, or fowl, if we were not programmed to pick out a pattern of midline elements, nose and mouth, and bilaterally symmetrical features, eyes and ears, and then infer a face from these few clues. But we would also not be tempted to see the face of a Martian monolith and invent a ridiculous scenario to fuel the headlines of shopping mall tabloids just because a large oval rock happens to feature a few fortuitous holes in the right places. Purcell has played upon our affinity for faces in her brilliant refurbishing of an old and tattered reverse painted glass chessboard. She left the dark squares as she found them, but festooned the white squares with a variety of complex overlays, mostly faces <clears throat> drawn from a wide range of sources, from Buffon's mulatto midget in the initial square to Tulp's famous orangutan in the last spot. In between, you will find, among others, some of history's famous conjoined twins, figures from tarot cards, twins from a medieval book of hours, a nun from an Italian stamp, a harpy, some birds, a few primates, and honest Abe on Mount Rushmore. The more you look, the more you see, as our program preferences search out their intended targets. Look hard enough and you will also find unintended faces in the unaltered dark squares. For oval shapes with appropriate blobs and dots often appear in random arrays. And our mental machinery for recognizing faces then performs the translation. Looking again, I can find a face on almost every dark square. Doesn't every cloud bank include a camel? Yes, faces are special. Even the words find linkage and synonymy. For face derives from facies, and special from species, and both Latin words mean roughly overt or external appearance. Hence we derive technical terms in my two fields of geology and biology. Facies, for the local environment recorded by characteristic features of strata, and species for the fundamental unit of our taxonomic hierarchy based on unique and distinctive features rather than shared properties of larger group, groups like genera and families. Hence also the two vernacular words, my title, face for a person's most evident and revealing feature and special for a distinctive and particular appearance. T.H. Huxley described our struggle to comprehend nature as a battle of wits. Quote, the chessboard is the world, the pieces are the phenomena of the universe, the rules of the game are what we call the laws of nature. The player on the other side is hidden from us, Unquote. In our ignorance and with our limitations, we do indeed see nature as through a glass darkly, but perhaps someday face to face. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> it was very descriptive. One day, one day I went into the mammal department with this object and I said, look, I think I've really found a fossil. I think I found something. And I had the pleasure of having three people bending over this object for a long time and saying, 
two fish, Devonian, maybe not, for a long time. And finally I said, you know what, um, it's actually a piece of a rubber tire. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked it up in Hawaii on the road and thought, it's, you know, I wonder what they're going to say to this. <laughs> now I'm going I'm to go really fast um, here, right? right? And you stop me. Okay, so the shapes of things, morphology, I just, the, the, the ammonite to me has become endlessly fascinating. And just the way it coils, the way it grows, this is a drawing, this is something it, that Ole Vorm did in his catalog of all of his entire collection. It is a beautiful engraving. Uh, now you see the ridges, you see those ridges, it is so accurate because that's exactly the way they form. They don't form in, in, straight, uh, in straight division. They're compared so well with a, with a contemporary picture of one. Now, form is everywhere, and I just like this snail so much from the um, Sargosa Sea that was um, Paré, Amboise Paré, in a book. And, and the thing about these forms is they do get me back into books and back into looking at places in which they reoccur in the spiral staircase. Now, turns out that, um, oh, this is not the one. Okay, well, it turns out, and I'm going to go back just to the spiral staircase for a minute. Um, there was a Robert, Robert Hooke had a beautiful book that was published after his death of, of Ammon, a lot of Ammonites in his book. He was also the man who helped build in the tower in London this a very incredible spiral staircase that was so much like the interior of an ammonite. Now this is a pattern, weather pattern, old weather pattern, which looks like the same thing. I think I left out the uh, fossil book. This is a fish on between on on, between glass. Glass is a medium that I use all the time. Now, um, it, can I can I just keep going, Sven? Or did sure. You, did you have this? Is that long? This one long? No, not? it's not terribly long. Not but... Terribly long. Maybe. Okay. So this is this is the this is one about um, you read you read the gannet. Gannets belong to the family Sulidae, a group of seabirds including the boobies and famed for a consequence of behavior that we regard as stupid. We make intuitive judgments about intelligence in animals, often most inappropriately by their degree of approximation to the two great differences that human heads have evolved, a rounded and high vaulted cranium and a short face. With their long beaks and flattened crania, Sulid skulls seem to deserve their name and reputation. This photo, however, appears to mock such a self-congratulatory attitude. We see the ghostly double reflection of a gannet skull on the glass surface of a bell jar placed above it. The curvature causes one reflection to assume those very features, short face and round cranium, that we deem a sign of intelligence. Is this a double inversion of the metaphor of Plato's cave? Is the real skull the shadow and that humanoid reflection the archetype? Or is the shadow only the reflection of our deepest cultural bias? Now, I'm, I'm, you encounter so much glass in museums, so many creatures under glass and have to deal with them in various ways. And finally, I've just sort of gone for the glass and for what you get. And in this, you get most of the skyline from Philadelphia back. And I took these bottles a couple of years ago and decided that there were some possible reflections in them. At the same time, a friend had asked if I would like to do a book on Shakespeare, and I said, no, I did not. And he said, well, why don't you try? And I took these bottles and found that, in fact, if you look into them, you get all sorts of, of, uh, of things. And so this is the Cliffs of Dover from um, uh, King Lear. There's a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it. Here is an art that nature makes. Over that art, 
which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. There's a stormy, a storm at sea. Is that the, oh, the moon one? Yes. Yes, okay. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls. Sometimes you see them, and not to see them. I'm sorry, I'm going to say that again. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls. Sometimes to see them, and not to see them. Now the ship boring the moon with her mainmast, and anon swallowed with yeast and froth as you'd thrust a cork into a hogshead. <laughs> 